uh, I was uh, not very modest and I didn't put many things about Fosters because I assumed that you all know who we are. We're a global firm, uh, 55 years uh, going strong. Our uh, culture is rooted in sustainability, but it has actually been a technology which is effectively what has allowed us to do a lot of the things that we have done for the past uh, 20 years. So uh, the title of the presentation was The White Rabbit, and that's uh, because for me, uh, technology, innovation, disruption is a white rabbit for the AAC industry. And we can choose to completely ignore it, right? Or we can choose like another Alice in Wonderland to just go down the rabbit hole. And down that rabbit hole, there is a lot of uncertainty and uneasiness and failure. There is a lot of failure, but there's also uh, quite a lot of possibilities. And I think this is good. It's good to take ourselves outside our comfort zone because outside our comfort zone there is chaos but there is also opportunity creativity and sometimes a little bit of magic and i love i love chaos like uh, wizwava shiborska did i say that correct Martin? yes uh, i prefer the hell of chaos to the hell of order and i'm actually very very lucky to have a team uh, three of them are sitting here with us right now who are into the chaos with me and they want to like bring disruption in, in our industry uh, as soon as possible so we are uh, the applied uh, R&D group at Foster & Partners. We are 16 people for 1,800. We've always been less than 1% of the total company. Uh, we are all architects, engineers, or both, but our common denominator is that we're all programmers and that we have a lot of different interests, starting from complex geometries to performance-driven design, uh, collaborative design tools, ML, IoT, smart buildings, you name it. We probably have done it one way or another. So. Um, I show these slides just to say technology is not something that is new to us, that we're like, wow, it has come. Uh, we have been doing it for over 20 years uh, from Swiss Re that most of you don't know has been developed in Excel and VBA because there was no parametric tool set, toolkit at the time, uh, to 15 years later, Mexico City Airport, where the entire space frame was algorithmically defined in order to be performative for all the different uh, things that uh, that airport required. So how, how do you scale up like that within uh, 15 years? Um, we, we basically said, okay, all the things that people think is a challenge, technology, disruption, innovation, let's take those and let's develop products and services to effectively create um, an agile process like DevOps, right? And in that, we're wanting to do what the IT industry has done, which is taking effectively development and operation and put them together in one concise space, one process. But then we're now taking it a step further and we're going for design ops, uh, which is what we're trying to, again, align with uh, the way I, the IT industry has, uh, has been developing, where UX and UI is trying now to keep up with the development that is happening in the space. And therefore, we're now trying to oper operationalize design itself. And when we're talking about design ops, the principles are you're orchestrating people, processes, and tools. And in our industry, these are the processes more or less, and they can be cyclical. And these are some of the people in that industry and this jump all over the place as well. And these are some of the tools that we have been creating in order to be kind of, it create that DevOps design ops workflow within the AC industry. So I will take you through a little journey through the different stages of design from conception to completion uh, up to operation. And I'll start with performance driven design um, what you see here, we've done more than 15 years ago, and it's effectively our effort to say uh, design is not linear, it's cyclical, and you want to have feedback all the time. So what we're trying to do here is effectively break the boundaries between physical and digital modeling, where you're actually uh, moving a model and capturing it uh, in real time. And as you do, uh, performance analysis like daylight, CFD analysis, connectivity are being analyzed in real time and projected in the model which what it does effectively is allowing designers to make intuitive yet informed decisions early on in the design process. And of course, as technology evolves, our tools evolve as well. Nowadays, uh, with games engines, we're creating uh, different applications that work like Minecraft in steroids that allow users to, again, do real-time design and analysis in whatever uh, hardware they, they choose to do it in whatever context. So from headset to touch screens to their desktops. And this is very important because 
you're allowing people as they design to understand the repercussions of their actions. This is the software working. And as you're kind of creating the massing, you're calculating the volume, the area, you're checking your daylight, you're checking your views. But also, you start having the opportunity to not only calculate hard criteria, but soft criteria. So nowadays, we're not only looking into like sunlight hours, but we're looking, what is the well-being index in these spaces? What is the operational carbon? What is the embodied carbon? And even what is the financial value? What is the ROI of that particular design when we work very closely with, with our clients? Um, our current tool uh, within uh, that framework is Thalia. And Thalia is very interesting because uh, it actually worked with this idea of a very intuitive UI that harnesses the power of all the simulation engines that we have developed in the office. One of which is Cyclops. Uh, Oscar, my friend there, my tall kind of Swedish friend is the architect behind Cyclops. And Cyclops was an idea that was developed in the group like 15 years ago, which said, how can we actually calculate what a good view is and how can we give that very, very quickly to the designers to appreciate how to shape the, the building? So that started by using the custom render in our software in MicroStation like many, many years ago, turned into an OpenGL viewer with C++ analytical engine, and is now using a CUDA-powered uh, optics uh, API to be able to run actually a tremendous amount of, uh, amount of use in very, very little time. And not only that, but we're able to not just look into views anymore, but anything that is ray trace based, like in this case, you see, um, Oscar is moving this uh, model around, he's moving the trees, I can see the daylight uh, in real time, I can see the views in real time, but also at the end of the day, uh, a report is provided, which is done automatically for every single project. So that reports on the left-hand side would be reports that the team would get for, with a click of a button based on the analysis that we've done. And you see the acceleration of these tools, right? 2007, 24 views per minute. Nowadays, we're doing 600,000 views per minute, which is the equivalent of 10 giga rays per second. Um, and this sort of acceleration actually allows us to um, create quite a lot of information very, very quickly. And can we then scale up? Can we create distributed computing and optimization as part of our design process? I mean, optimization is not something that is new. We have been doing that for many years. UA Pavilion, inspired by the desert, uh, having a reaction diffusion algorithm create panels that are all different inside, but have all the same perimeter. And therefore you can choose pick and choose how many you want to create to deliver that pavilion and put them in any way you want. So, okay, run optimization, see how many panels you can get, minimum number of panels, but maximum differentiation in terms of their placement in the pavilion. But if you start thinking about objectives for a building, um, there are a few, right? But you go down to the city level, the city scale, these objectives explode everything from like sustainability criteria to financial models within a city. They drive the way we think about urban space. And for that, uh, we now have Hydra, which is our distributed community system, the architect of which is Martin sitting there with a nice little thing on his jacket. Uh, so Hydra has allowed us to effectively scale up optimization. And rather than thinking of the idea of like, how many options can I create for a city and analyze before I, my time is up? We're doing the opposite. We, let, we say, okay, we'll set up the criteria and the objectives and we'll allow the computer to do the heavy lifting for us. So we set up a, a model based on design aspirations and we allow it to run effectively in parallel and create hundreds of thousands of options on a city scale. These options are then being analyzed for the different criteria. In this case, we have the area, we have visibility, we had connectivity and views. And as we analyze them, the solution converges to a pseudo-optimal space from which we can pick where we start from. We don't pick the final solution, we pick where we start from. And we can do that through our own kind of web applications. And uh, that is actually a really cool thing to do because we have all this fast analysis, we harness the power of all this analysis, and we're actually creating an interface that is based on parallelization on, on the cloud, on our on-prem cloud with GPU and CPU empowerment with a web dashboard that allows people to visualize all these options that sit uh, like on the left and right hand side of a REST API that allows us to also create a huge database of different options. To understand the number of options we're talking, 
Uh, if you were to create one option by yourself, that's the equivalent of doing 90 options using just Cyclops and doing 260 options at the same time using uh, one of uh, using Hydra. So we're talking about 5,000 different options that are analyzed around in four different simulations within 24 hours. So the amount of data that we're producing just from these generative models is insane. What can you do with all that data? I mean, we had all this discussion about machine learning in the morning. I thought it was a great panel. Um, I talked briefly about us kind of using machine learning as surrogate models uh, in search engines, as design assist models, and for business insights. Uh, surrogate models were some of the earliest models that we uh, kind of explored because it was easy, because we had Hydra and we could create, for example, hundreds of thousands of floor plates that we could then analyze through Hydra, create our data set, and actually train the system uh, to kind of directly understand what a special and visual connectivity for a space would be, which is very important when you're doing offices and actually it's very, very time consuming. But not just doing it for the fun of it. Okay, we've, run, we've done a machine learning application. The point is, how do you put this in the hands of the designers? So again, there you're going into that process, that design ops process where we're creating tools directly sitting on the Rhino where people can go create the space, click the button, there you go, that's your analysis. And as you've seen, the delta of what is actually calculated to what is predicted is minimal. So for early design processes, this is absolutely fine. Um, we have a huge amount of data in the office and that data is not just about um, images, it's about a lot of documentation and a lot of knowledge that sits in the minds of people in the office that may be old or young or whatever. Uh, our current kind of crusade is around um, the democratization of that knowledge. So we have developed applications that allows effectively using natural language processing to be able to retrieve answering questions like, what is the best kind of material for a window for this fire regulation? And you will get the answer and you will get also the PDF in which this answer sits. And that allows people to now not try to find in a huge office, who has the question, but directly retrieve that answer. Five minutes, very quickly. Mid journey, we talked about it. We're not so much into creating something directly for mid journey, but using it uh, as um, a composite of where it sits with our actual designs. And you can obviously do things like that with a lot of these models. And I'm not going to go into that too much, but the way that we're like using diffusion models is like that. So this is an app that my colleague Sheriff did within a week where he has the model you are on the left hand side in rhino that model uh, is directly passed in a stable diffusion and then comes back all the different options in rhino around different potentials that say or oh, give me a, a, a nice sunny building sort of uh, prompt we talked about performance driven design we talked about uh, distributed computing we talked about machine learning but at the end of the day we are doing all these things to create buildings and funnily enough, we're not so much in the business of creating buildings, but we're in the business of creating experiences. So to do that, we want to put people within the experience. Um, this is a project that was done like 25 years ago with UCL. Headsets cost 100,000 K per person. Uh, obviously, hard, the hardware was not there back then, but the ideas of how we can use this technology were. So nowadays, we use this sort of uh, tools, not as a visualization tool, but mostly as a design collaboration tool and at the fraction of the time, our current um, tool product around that is Glaucon that allows for real time experience of a space uh, as you sit on the space with like real time mockups that we are investigating with our clients and, uh, and contractors, allowing us to not spend money on true mockups and also cut down on CO2 emissions as it comes to that. And also allowing us to give people like our clients an iPad and go on site and check it, it, check it, check options yourself. But also had been really interesting during the pandemic as well in terms of how we collaborate. So Glaucon has become the basis of our in-house collaborative um, design tool where you can have different people from all over the world running like real time reviews uh, in something that resembles our office. And we're talking about people. We can't talk about uh, interoperability. It's all about how you put everything together, how different people collaborate. And we have all these discussions all the time uh, in this room. And everybody has their own flavor of interoperability. We have Hermes, 
uh, Hermes has been very interesting for us because it has allowed us to deliver uh, projects like the Lusail Towers on Time, where the entire kind of project has dropped by 10 floors, like literally a week before delivery. And dropping that tower by 10 floors doesn't mean that you just chop off 10 floors. Everything changes, structures change, MEP change, everything. But because all these different disciplines, including external consultants, were hooked through our Hermes software, that meant that that change propagated simultaneously throughout all these packages, and the tower was delivered on time and on budget. And of course, we are looking into what else is out there. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Rhino inside, you all know, going directly from Rhino to a BIM model or like NVIDIA Omniverse, we have developed our own um, custom tools on that for um, digital reviews. I will close with something that everybody talks about. And I, I guess like if you ask 100 people, you'll get 100 different options of what this is, digital twin. Um, we're trying to understand what it is. And to do so, we are effectively eating our own dog food, where we have created our own IoT toolkit and digital twin for the office, having our own smart campus application, Anders, again, sitting here is the person to talk about that. Uh, with our OI to toolkit, our application can monitor our entire campus. And we have the possibility of not only visualizing that data, but actually looking it in 4D and understanding how operationally is going to change our building, which we scanned ourselves in order to basically check as built against us design using this fellow here. We were the first architectural firm to have used uh, Boston Dynamics spot with Brian Wrigley being a huge help on that and uh, trying to understand how that sort of technology, disruptive technologies like spot, can effectively change the industry, not only checking as built as against as design uh, situations, but also on creating 4D, four dimensional models of spaces that have to do with data changing over time. I'm between you and a loop break, so I will leave you here. Um, we talk about the white rabbit, about disruption, about the fear of the unknown. Um, this guy on the right-hand side is Steve Jobs, offering the first Mac computer in Sean Lennon in 1984. Um, Keith Haring is on the left, and then you have Andy Warhol on the right. And they're all looking at this thing, thinking, what are we possibly going to do with it? Well, I think we know where that went. So... I think I'm preaching to the converted, but if you haven't done so, just please follow the white rabbit and know that we're hiring. So <laughs> we are a little bit of a white rabbit.